Our first speaker today is actually a teacher of mine. Her name is Nikki Costello. She's a certified Iyengar yoga teacher. She has been teaching for over 22 years and was previously certified in Jiva Mukti Yoga and Anyasara Yoga. For eight years, she taught exclusively for the Siddha Foundation as a Hatha Yoga and meditation teacher. As part of the organization, she taught Hatha Yoga in retreats and events in North America, South America, Europe, India, and China. It was during this time that she began cultivating a practice of meditation and deepened her study of yogic scriptures and philosophical texts. She lives in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and teaches public classes at Kuli Yoga in Tribeca and Williamsburg, and Yoga Shanti. She maintains a well-recognized private practice in New York City, training and guiding individuals on all levels of their health and well-being. Nikki is passionate about sharing the study and practice of yoga. She has created several unique educational opportunities for yoga students, which include the teacher's practice, the mentor practice, the sutra practice, and the enrichment practice. She continues to lead retreats and workshops all over the world, and in 2013 to 2014 was a contributing editor at Yoga Journal, writing the magazine's basics column. So with that, please welcome Nikki Costello and her talk, One Sutra for a Lifetime. My name is Nikki Costello, and I am delighted to be here with all of you. I'm also honored to be amongst such an esteemed gathering of teachers. Thank you. When one chooses to convey and share their knowledge, we call them teachers. That which springs forth in us, that which wants to be shared, is through the experience that we've had of the practices of yoga, and we're drawn to sharing. That's how it happened for me. Many years ago, I accepted the invitation to teach and I had absolutely no idea the journey that would unfold in front of me. In fact, I had only been practicing yoga at that time for about two years and was asked if I would teach. I was invited to teach. And at first, I was excited. I thought, how fantastic. I, I keep speaking about how the yoga practice is changing my life. How awesome that I could actually share that with others. And then I became terrified. Because the subject of yoga was so vast. Uh, there was so much to learn. There was so much that I felt like I didn't know. I thought, how am I going to stand up in front of a group of eager young students and teach? At that moment, I recognized that it was a, a critical change, an essential change, and an extraordinary change in the way that I was actually approaching practice. Initially, I started to practice, and uh, I'm a Hatha Yoga practitioner. Nowadays, one could begin the practice of yoga by studying the scriptures um, as a meditator. Hatha yoga was definitely my path, and there were just a little bits of the other, a little bit of opening a text or a little bit of meditation, only at the end of a Hatha yoga practice. So. What started to happen for me is I realized that the moment that I was asked to teach, that I was going to be responsible for how someone else received the teachings. And in that moment, I felt like I became infused with a sense of purpose that changed the way that I got onto the mat. I started to practice alone. And that was new. At the beginning of practice, uh, I would go to class when I could. 
I started with one class a week, went on to practice for three times a week, and then with the invitation to teach, I recognized that there had to be more time with myself, with a plan, so that I could convey what I had to convey to the students. I'm extraordinarily grateful for that very first invitation to teach because I certainly hadn't seen myself as a teacher or somebody that would be here with you today in this way. And I feel as though I, I, I also owe all of those students that have sat with me over the years, uh, I owe them my gratitude because that experience developed a dialogue. So I'd like to speak a little bit about um, what I mean by that. As a teacher, when I began to stand in front of students and look out at them, other kind of information started to come through that looking, through that seeing, through that observation. Whether it was how they were moving their body or watching where their eyes went and what kept their attention, what I recognized is that all that information that started to come from them created a dialogue, though they were not speaking out loud. They weren't necessarily asking questions with their words. They were actually showing me what in fact they understood and what they didn't understand. So I began to listen in that way. The eyes began to observe. The ears began to listen though that listening wasn't necessarily an outward listening to sounds, it became an inner listening. I became more sensitive to how my body felt when I was connected to what I was saying and how it felt when I was just saying something that I didn't fully understand. All this started to happen very quickly in the service of teaching. So I began at that moment to look more closely at the steps that I was taking, the process that I was taking in order to not only prepare a class, but in order to understand something more deeply for myself. So I'm speaking about a time now that was 22 years ago. And at that time, believe it or not, we didn't think that we would be taking courses online. Uh, we couldn't hear about a teaching in class and go to a source like the web to find out more information. In fact, at that time, if I wanted to know more about something that my teacher said, I had to seek out that information in all sorts of different ways. At that time, it meant that I had to save my money to buy a book. And I could and needed to go to my teacher directly and ask the question if something was unclear. So let me uh, begin to share with you the first text the first yoga book I ever bought, Light on Yoga. Light on Yoga by BKS Iyengar was considered the Bible of yoga study, of Hatha Yoga Asanas. And one of the ways in which I would approach the text was I would look at a photo, I would look at a picture, I would observe the way that his body was in each of the poses. Along with the photo was 
the name of the pose, the Sanskrit name of the pose. And a further description of what that name meant. And if it had associated with it uh, a myth or a tale from yoga philosophy, it was shared. If it meant something simple like side, parshva, the name began to describe what it was that was both the objective or what the image represented or the sage that it was named after. In addition to the description of the name, there was and still are steps, how to get into the pose, how long one might stay there, how to come out of the pose, and what benefits it would have on the body. So what I soon began to notice is that all of this that was right there on the page was also informing a process of study, a way to be able to engage with then what became the second yoga text I added to my library, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Now, many Hatha Yoga teachers use again and again one sutra. The sutra that has asana in it. From the second pada, verse 46, stiram sukham asanam. Stiram steady, sukham, joyful, happy, asanam, seat, or posture. This is what I had. This is what I memorized. This is what I was able to repeat over and over and over again. Stiram, steady, sukham, happy, asanam, seat. In the same way, I began to use that sutra to look at many aspects of my life and to contemplate what in fact is steady? What is steadiness? What is steadfastness? What does it mean in this circumstance in my life? What does steady mean on my mat doing an asana practice? What does steady mean when my mind is running here and there? What does steady mean when something isn't going my way or I wish the outcome in a circumstance was something other than what was being presented? This word stiram exposed itself, showed itself about 15 years later. I had been participating in a day of meditation. I started in the early hours and it was going to be a full day from early morning until evening in the practice of meditation, in the practice of chanting, and in the practice of contemplation. And every time I was going into and out of meditation, I noticed that it felt as though not much was happening. I felt still. I felt quiet inside. And when I 
came out of meditation and was writing in my journal, I would simply write, I was steady. And I remember coming to the end of that day having felt as if a wish was unfulfilled. Nothing really extraordinary happened. I didn't have some beautiful, you know, vision in front of me or a surge of creativity. I was walking home and I experienced silence. And I experienced as if I, my awareness was seated inside my heart, steady. And it wasn't until probably a day or two later in my practice of meditation that I realized that in fact that steadiness was a gift. That what had borne fruit was a contemplation from my early days of practice, what is steady, to an actual experience in meditation of a steadiness, a sensation that all parts of myself were seated in the heart. As I continued to contemplate that experience, I understood that these words, the words that we find in the sacred scriptural texts, lend themselves to action. They lend themselves to an experience and that they are and can be cultivated over a period of time. The other experience that arose, which felt like my own inner wisdom, was that to be steady as a yogi is an attainment. It's a practice.